30 years ago, my husband was arrested and sent to prison. I was left with four children aged from six weeks to 12 years. It was raining the night he was arrested. We were all in bed. About six police detectives came into our house. They took my husband into the bathroom. I'm not sh really sure why they, they did that, but when they brought him out, they handcuffed him in front of our children. The oldest one started screaming at the detectives, don't take my father away. My middle daughter hid under the bed while they searched our house. My three-year-old son didn't understand what was happening and the baby was asleep. They had brought a woman police officer with them to look after the children and they took me to the police station to interview me. After the interview, they told me that my husband wasn't coming home. I was in shock, so the lawyer drove me home and crashed my car. <laughs> I was so traumatised that I can't remember what happened when I actually got home. And even what I said to the children, what we did, I just remember the woman police officer leaving. I was totally honest with the children all the way. I did explain to them what had happened and that we still loved Dad and we had to wait and see what would happen with the courts, but I didn't really know what was going to happen next. Before the arrest, the school where my two eldest daughters went uh, was doing a project about the crime. So when the arrest took place, it was hugely embarrassing and really shameful for my children. The school was very embarrassed and they didn't know how to handle it either. My eldest daughter hated the police for taking her dad away. She started to go downhill fast. She started to play up and act out very quickly. My son started wetting and stopped eating. I was breastfeeding the baby at that time and my milk dried up. And because of the trauma, I couldn't feed or even hold the baby. My husband started off in remand at Addington Prison. It was a terrible place. You weren't allowed to touch each other. There was a great long barrier down the centre of the room. That's, and Dad sat on one side and Mum and kids sat on the other. During that whole nine months he was there, my husband never got to hold our baby until one day a kind prison officer turned his back so he could hold her for a split second. We sold our homestead at a huge loss and moved to Christchurch to be close to him. By some miracle, a man with the house one block from the prison invited us to share his house. It was rent free. And my husband used to hear me calling the cat. I began to reflect on what had happened and started to hate my husband for what he did. And I was thinking I wanted to leave. It was just all too hard. Every single day was a hassle. Meanwhile, the children were being bullied at school and being called jailbirds. They had no friends. I couldn't give them the support they needed and I didn't know who to turn to. I was alone and isolated. Then one day, I had a normal housewife's day. I got up and I cleaned the floor, I vacuumed, my children came home from school, they were fine. And I went to bed that night and I said, thank you God for my normal day. And I had an experience with God that changed my life. And after that, my whole life turned around and I no longer had that hate and unforgiveness towards my husband. It was like God had laid a purpose in my life that everything was going to be all right. Five years later, I find, find myself at a meeting with 12 women, with children, all who had a family member in prison. A meeting that started at 5.30 p.m. finished at three in the morning. 10 hours of sharing their experiences with one another, crying with one another, and supporting one another. We realized that we had been trying to cope alone all this time, and we needed support. As soon as we started coping together, it felt good. That was the birth of pillars. This year, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of supporting the children of prisoners and their families. 25 years ago, there was no support for these people. There was no support for us. 
We could get handouts, food parcels, etc., but no hand, hands up. Pillars advocates for children's rights, provides a wraparound service which includes home-based support for the family, a mentoring program for the children, and support to help fathers in prison bond with their children. A service like ours is more essential than you might imagine. New Zealand has one of the highest rates of imprisonment in the Western world, about 50% more per capita than Australia. By 2016, our inmate population is expected to hit 10,700. When I hear statistics like that, my first thought is not the financial cost of building and staffing new penal institutions, but the human costs borne by the estimated 20,000 children whose parents are behind bars right now. The clamour for harsher prison sentences is louder than ever, but in depriving criminals of their freedom, we are also depriving thousands of children of their parents. Through no fault of their own, these children are suddenly, and often for extensive periods, separated from one or both parents. They are frequently required to move from their family environment and provided with little, if any, specialised support or counselling. Many children suffer physical, mental, behavioural and emotional problems that deteriorate over time, with a small number described by our, by our researcher as walking powder kegs badly in need of high quality interventions. Chronic bedwetting, nightmares, anxiety, anger and depression and aggravated eczema and asthma are common. These 20,000 children are seven times more likely to end up in prison than their friends in the playground. They bear the punishment for the sins of their parents and are often treated badly, considered guilty by association. Sometimes sending a parent to jail can bring changes for the better. For example, when a sexually abuse, abusive father is punished or the neglected child of an alcoholic mother finally gets enough to eat. But mostly, youngsters are worse off, and both caregivers and children attribute that to the absence of imprisoned parents rather than their criminality. Children are often ashamed and don't know how to reconcile their love for their parent with the rejection from the community. One girl we interviewed was so humiliated, she told her school friends that her dad worked for the government, figuring it wasn't a lie because he worked on a prison farm. <laughs> this same girl was questioned by her best friend's father about where her own father was. When she finally told him that her father was in prison, he refused to let her see his daughter any longer. Friends are a lifeline, and it's devastating if that support is cut off. Once that happens, they don't want to go to school, truancy happens, and they drop out. That begins the spiral downhill. The cost of that spiral is staggering. Former Justice Minister Simon Power said that a male teenager on the wrong side of the tracks and heading towards a life of crime will cost society three million dollars over his lifetime. These little ones may not know it, but they are already holding a key to their future prison cell. But giving them the support they need could be the key to a reduced crime rate in our nation. In 2011, after two years researching the needs of children and families of prisoners, we released a report called Invisible Children. Our research showed that agencies working in the justice system were child blind. They had no programs in place to address the collateral damage that results from parental incarceration. But since our report, the Department of Corrections has adopted child-friendly practices within New Zealand prisons, and child-friendly policies are being considered by the Justice and Department of Police Systems. We abide by the Bill of Rights, drawn up by the San Francisco Children of Incarcerated Parents Organisation, which offers 
powerful guarantees for the welfare of children of prisoners. That children will be kept safe and informed when a parent is arrested. That they will have the right to see, touch and speak with their parent. That children are considered when decisions are made about their parent. That children are cared for in the absence of their parent. That children's voices are heard. We would love to see this Bill of Rights adopted by all childcare and justice agencies in New Zealand. But in reality, there is still a huge stigma attached to having a jailbird as a parent. So can anything be done? I just want to tell you about this kid that came to Pillars in the early days. and He was a real entrepreneur. He used to steal shoes from the back doors of Fendleton properties. And then he'd take them to school and he'd sell them for pocket money. <laughs> <laughs> we could see the potential in this young man, <laughs> but we were able to channel these skills into more positive activities like organising fundraisers. This same young man today is now a respected businessman in Christchurch because he got the mentorship and support he needed to make better choices. So here's my big idea. So I'd like you to meet Destry. Destry Tumataiki was born to serve. He joined the army just after high school and was a soldier for many years until he moved to the Air Force here in Auckland, where he is a C-130 airload master for 40 Squadron and a dad to three adult children. Are you on this trip tomorrow, Dave? Two years ago, Destry was encouraged by a friend to volunteer as a mentor with Pillars. So they're looking for male mentors? And so I thought that the concept was a good idea. Uh, to have some sort of positive impact in their whole life is, is really important, I, I guess. And that's all part of mentoring. How do you find time? Um, I guess it's a matter of finding time. Um, everybody's busy, I guess. Uh, so I just have to find the time. Destry is paired with a young teenager. He's trying to fill the void that's been left by a dad behind bars. He'd never been to a, a bowling alley, he'd never been to a, a restaurant. And at 13 years old, that's pretty, um, I don't know, sheltered, I guess. But um, to experience that with him and see his attitude change and, and being brought into something like that is, is quite amazing. So my dream is, that every one of these 20,000 children will no longer be our next generation of prisoners, but be the people they were destined to be. For them to have access to the services they need. That they don't suffer from shame and stigma, but are accepted and cared for by their communities. For ordinary citizens to share of themselves, to step up and mentor these children for corporates and businesses to support their employees to do this through financial giving and paid off time. That the children be a strong and powerful force in this nation, breaking the intergenerational cycle and making New Zealand a better place in which to live. Working together, we can lead 20,000 children out of bondage into a land of safety and security, a land of peace and freedom, freedom from addictions, poverty, rejection, violence, isolation, and a criminal lifestyle. New Zealand's a small nation, it is possible. I know we can do this together, one child at a time. Thank you.